Hello and welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. First of all, I'm very happy to report that this podcast has been ranked the number 1 podcast for Indian mythology amongst listeners in India. This is very much thanks to all of your feedback and your support. Check the link on the site sfipodcast.com to take a quick look at the rankings. In this episode we are going to talk about Kali. Many of you listeners have requested to hear the story of this goddess. And that's exactly what we are going to do this time. We'll cover a rather gory battle. And in the end, we'll talk about Kali's connections to two of the most famous rock and roll bands in history. And a connection with an Indiana Jones movie as well. Before we begin today's story, it's worth me explaining something about my dad. If you've heard previous shows, you know by now that my dad is Brahma, the creator of the universe. When he is not creating new stuff, he is creating new supervillains. It's not that he deliberately wants to create supervillains. It's just that he is very easy to please and far more generous with superpowers than I would have liked. The only thing he's got going for him is that he manages to work in some weakness so that the newly created supervillains are not completely indestructible. I pray to the world that my dad never forgets to put a weakness into someone he's giving superpowers to. The entire universe is going to pay a heavy price if he does. Now, I know the future and I know exactly what happens. So, I do already know whether Brahma is going to cause the destruction of the universe or not. But I can't tell you if that happens. I have a duty to humankind and rules to play by. I can't tell you anything that might disrupt the stock market either. That's one of the strictest rules. You'll thank me later. Maybe. Now, not one, not two, not three, but four villains in today's story got their powers by praying to Brahma. So you'll see why that preamble was necessary. Shumbha was the new leader of the Asuras. His predecessor was Mahishasur. We have previously seen the goddess Durga defeating Mahishasur. That was in the character of the week segment on episode 4. But that was so long ago. Shumbha objected. The listeners could use a recap. And he is right. So what happened there was that Mahishasur, a half buffalo and half asur, defeated a lot of devs and drove them from their homes. He was able to do that because he was invincible. Thanks to my dad. Luckily, the catch was that Mahishasur had asked that he not be defeated by any man or god. He didn't say woman or goddess which just goes to show what a misogynist he was. He got what he deserved when the goddess Durga defeated him and ended his life. Things should have been back to a happy state then. But Shumbha and his brother Nishumbha attacked Swarg again. The Devs 
had barely returned to swarg before they were ejected from their heavenly home again shumbha and his brother themselves had the same kind of powers from brahma as mahishasur had but i won't explain their weakness that is for another time now as shumbha and his brother were settling themselves into heaven or swarg they were also busy tracking the remaining devs these devs had only recently installed elaborate trackers so they could see where all the other devs were a wise thing to have if they quickly needed to find each other but at the same time it was very unwise to leave the system without any kind of password protection an asur who had been monitoring the device approached the new asur king commander shumbha i see the devs are assembled in the himalayas bro should we fire missiles at them nishumbha suggested nope said shumbha do you know how much those missiles cost both time and money let's just send a couple of asurs to spy on them maybe capture some embarrassing videos that we can post on social media to shame these thieves so they sent chanda and munda two asurs they made their way quickly to where the devs were the asurs were looking for embarrassing videos but what they found was very different you see the devs were praying to durga i mean they had great success from praying to durga the last time she defeated mahishasur but as it happens instead of durga parvati appeared on the scene parvati was shiva's wife and shiva if you don't know is the destroyer of the universe together with my dad the creator and vishnu the preserver they form the holy trinity in indian mythology when parvati appeared the devs all started talking together all at once in this babel of noises you would not have understood a word of what was said but then parvati is a goddess with her divine superpowers she knew exactly why the devs had come she raised a hand and instantly there was silence i know you wanted durga but give her a break will you she just defeated mahishasur for you can't you keep these asurs busy for a day or two another babel of voices and again parvati had to raise a hand for silence all right all right i'll get on it no sooner had she spoken those words when suddenly in their midst appeared another goddess this was ambika a dev nudged his neighbor in the elbow and whispered she kind of looks like durga with the tiger thing and all those weapons in all her arms hey smart mouth said ambika who had heard the whispered remark allow me to have my own identity here if it's not too much trouble to your poor offended sensibilities the dev quickly apologized but ambika ignored him i have a plan to defeat these asurs a plan what is it asked the dev enthusiastically it's a proposal or intention or decision about what to do next and next time you need to know what a word means look it up yourself in a dictionary as for what the actual plan is today i'm just going to wait here she said that sounded like an odd sort of plan to defeat the asurs but the devs were too afraid 
to question Ambika. The two Asur brothers had been listening to all this. Ambika will be perfect. She's just the queen I was looking for, a voice said. It was Shumbha. His voice was coming from Munda's phone. The Asur king was watching what Chanda and Munda were secretly broadcasting. Chanda was puzzled by this. I thought we came here to murder these thieves. Now you want us to take your proposal to her? Munda silently tapped his head off camera to indicate that their king had finally gone mad. Probably because he was drunk on all his power. But an order is an order. So the two Asurs walked straight up to Ambika. They even carried a truce flag to make sure that they wouldn't get blasted out of sight. We have a proposal for you. How would you like to be queen of the Asurs? They asked Ambika. If Ambika was surprised, she didn't show it. She thought for a moment and then replied. It's an interesting proposition. I'm going to, as the expression goes, play a little hard to get. Go tell your king that if he wants me, he has to defeat me in a battle first. You and what army? asked Munda, eyes narrowing suspiciously. No army, just plain old me, she laughed. Now, off you boys go, chop chop. You can't keep an Asur king waiting. The two Asurs called in. Shumba had been plucking petals from a flower hoping the answer would reveal that Ambika, in fact, would accept his proposal. But he was disappointed. Still, when he thought about it, he figured Ambika was just testing him. She wanted to make sure he was worthy. No problem. He would send one of his finest Asurs, Dharmalochan, with say, a small regiment of 60,000 troops. That should be enough to abduct a lady, even if she rode a tiger. Dharmalochan was not prepared for what happened next. Ambika was calmly sitting on a rock, her tiger also beside her. 60,000 troops and Dharmalochan arrived. Ambika simply snapped her fingers and just like that, 60,000 troops and Dharmalochan evaporated. Chanda and Munda were standing with dropped jaws. They seemed frozen in place and only Shumbha's scream from Munda's phone spurred them into action. The Asur king was yelling at them to bring her to him immediately to drag her by the hair. That last comment, which Ambika heard, infuriated her. She was playing by the rules. So far, she hadn't even touched any of the Asurs. How dare they even attempt to lay a finger on her? And by her hair? She had just had it styled. This was not going to end well for the Asurs. As she was thinking this, a figure burst forth from within Ambika. This was Kali. Kali embodied Parvati slash Durga slash Ambika's anger. And that explained why she looked so ready for violence. Chanda and Munda didn't stand a chance. Kali sliced off their heads before they even had a chance to raise their eyebrows. It's possible that Shumba wouldn't even have known what had happened to the pair. 
But as it happens, they were live on a video call with their master. Shumba was angry and thirsting for revenge. He summoned Raktabij. When Raktabij arrived, Shumba was glad to see his trusted ace, his trump card. I'm so done with this lady. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Why? What happened to Mr. Nice Guy? Asked Raktabij. Oh, you're talking about my butler. Yeah, Mr. Guy resigned. He's moved on to become a butler at some dave's house. I offered him a retention bonus, but I think he just wanted a better gig. He's not around anymore. Anyway, don't worry about him. When I said no more Mr. Nice Guy, I was using the expression. I didn't mean it literally. I meant I'm not going to hold back any longer. So Raktabij, go, destroy Parvati and any more avatars she throws at you. Being asked to murder the wife of the destroyer of the universe should have made even the bravest assassin hesitate a little. But if Raktabij had any apprehension, he didn't show it. Yeah, no problem, he said. Are you going for something subtle? I can make it look like an accident. Mind you, there's a 25% surcharge for that. But Shumba didn't care if it looked like an accident or not. He wasn't worried about retaliation from Shiva, thanks to his superpowers from Brahma. He preferred to avoid the surcharge and recommended a direct attack. Raktabij rode his horse and set out for the Himalayas, where Parvati slash Durga slash Ambika slash Kali slash Chandika and anyone else was hanging out. He went alone. The goddess he spotted first was Durga. Raktabij approached her single-handed. He hadn't even drawn his sword. Is this guy bold or foolish or what? asked Durga. I can't get a read on him, her tiger replied. Normally, enemies are either attacking us or running away. I never had someone walk up before. Something was wrong with this picture. But Durga couldn't figure out what. Raktabich was smiling. Maybe he's trying to make friends. Maybe Shumba wants to call a truce, the tiger suggested. But Durga dismissed it almost immediately. Evil grin, murderous expression on face, and the empty body bag he is carrying that says reserved for Durga. I think I must disagree with you. Or maybe he's just not smart, Durga thought, as she lazily swung her sword and sliced the asur. But she was about to find out how wrong she was. Whatever was left of Raktabij collapsed and a substantial amount of blood spread in all directions. That was too easy, Durga said. She still couldn't shake the feeling that something had gone horribly, horribly wrong. And then, suddenly, it all made sense. You remember how I told you there are four characters in today's show who have superpowers from Brahma? Well, we already met three of them. Raktabij was the fourth. His superpower was a little different from the other three. And that became apparent to Durga and her tiger as the ground began shaking. Suddenly, thousands of copies of Raktabij appeared all around her. Every drop of Raktabij that had touched the ground had become a new Raktabij. This was a horrible nightmare. 
as hundreds of thousands of rakta beejas advanced on her durga had a major problem on all of her eight hands she realized almost immediately that this situation was quickly going to become unwinnable it was frustrating the asurs seemed like they might win not by force but by simply existing in much greater numbers than everyone else this was the earliest version of a denial of service attack that has become all too familiar in this internet age except these asurs were going to starve everyone else of actual tangible physical resources and not just starve them of server time it wasn't that raktabij was a fighter quite the contrary an individual raktabij seemed to be a pushover but when they were all gathered like that sheer numbers would prevent them from falling over it would be a struggle to avoid accidentally creating more raktabijs Durga's tiger in his rush to break free of the mob accidentally scratched his claw against one of the clones in front of him. Oops, sorry, said the tiger. But the damage was done. Many more drops of blood hit the ground and a bunch more rakta beech clones popped up. This is an interesting observation, said the tiger. when they had broken free and moved off to a distance each clone seems to have inherited all the knowledge and skills of the original does that mean every single drop of blood has a complete copy of everything in the asur body its brain the medical history what we want durga said is some way to not make any more clones we have to destroy those millions of rakta beejas without letting a single drop of blood hit the ground and why just blood maybe it'll happen with hair or any other part of the body they were still trying to figure out a strategy when the solution appeared on the scene it was kali kali was still in a furious rage and she was absolutely decimating what was left of chanda and munda kali and durga locked eyes and that was all it took for kali to know what she was dealing with they were both aspects of the same goddess parvati so this kind of telepathy should hardly surprise anyone kali jumped right into the middle of the mob raktabijas were stumbling against themselves but kali was swift and brutal the scene is too gory to describe but the short version is that kali extended her tongue and spread it out all over the ground like a carpet with her very open mouth she quickly devoured as many of the raktabijas as she could The few Raktabij clones that remained realized a moment too late that Kali was eating them faster than they were growing because she had cut off their access to the ground. Desperately, they started cutting each other and trying to spill blood as far and wide as possible. But Kali was far too quick for them. She devoured every last Raktabij and she seemed hungry for more there was a murderous rage in her eyes and she was dancing a passionate dance shiva who so far had sat out the battle thought that it was wise to intervene at this point given those crazy superpowers that his opponents had he would not have helped much if he had intervened earlier shiva lay down on the ground right in kali's path kali stepped on shiva and stopped immediately she calmed down 
That was the effect Shiva had hoped to have on this aspect of Parvati. And it worked. Kali was significantly calmer after that. And she did not insist on eating any more asars. At least, not for the rest of the day. Shumbha and Nishumbha seethed in fury back in Swarg. Their ace, their trump card, was beaten. They were not going to win this. But that didn't mean they weren't going to try. At a minimum, they decided they were going to destroy Parvati. Whether they actually did it or not is not a surprise, given Parvati is still around. But their fight with Parvati is a separate story by itself, something we'll try to cover in a future episode. A few notes on the show. We have met Kali before on this podcast. Check out the links in the show notes to those episodes. Kali is often shown with unkempt hair, wearing a skirt of human arms and a garland of human heads. Her tongue is hanging out and it is fully red. That's evidence that she indeed absorbed every drop of Raktapija's blood. Her red tongue hanging out of her mouth was what the Rolling Stones adapted as a logo. And earlier, the Beatles had made a movie called Help. A major theme of the movie is a cult that worships a goddess very similar to Kali. This goddess demands a sacrifice of blood. A Kali-worshipping cult also appears in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But the Kali depiction isn't the only thing that's inaccurate in the movie. Especially if you're familiar with India, it's very likely that one scene will make you cringe. And I'm talking about the dinner scene that takes a very inaccurate view of Indian cuisine. So much so that I would have to agree with one movie critic who said that the real villain in that movie wasn't Amrish Puri, but the director, Steven Spielberg himself. That's all for this time. In the next episode, we'll cover another story by listener request. This one is a story from the Singhasan Bhattisi. This is a story from amongst 32 stories that were told to Raja Bhoj as he attempted to sit on King Vikramaditya's throne. The narrators of these stories were actually part of the decorations on the elaborate throne. The purpose was to challenge Bhoj. Was he worthy of sitting on the mighty throne? We'll see what Bhoj concludes when he's heard the next story. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.